again, good morning. It's so good to, to be with you this morning. And as always, it's, uh, it's humbling to be opening the, the word of the Lord with you this morning. I thank you for entrusting me with this great responsibility. You know, it really feels good to be on the inside, you know, to be a part of the club. Uh, it feels great. There's something about it that makes us feel special, important, validated. It, it gives us a, a real sense of, of self-worth and, and value. I still can remember the first time I ever had that feeling of, uh, of being in the in club. I was in the third grade in Mrs. Lee's class at St. Mark's Elementary School. Uh, there was a girl who sat next to me in class that I had a crush on, uh, and apparently this particular day, uh, this girl and her best friend who was in the class got into a, a fight uh, over at recess, and so after recess, when we came back to our desk, uh, she began passing me notes uh, during the class, and the notes began with, don't you think my friend is ugly? Well, considering my greater desire was to impress the girl I, I had a crush on, I wrote, yes, and I passed it back. Well, this exchange continued, uh, and it kept growing uh, with one disparaging remark after the other, uh, and of course, each time I answered in the affirmative uh, and passed the note back, a and man, it felt good. It felt good. I was on the inside of something. I was in the club. I was, uh, I was a part of this exclusive club with the shared power of passing judgment on somebody else. And it felt great at the time. It, it of course, uh, had the added bonus of impressing the girl that I had a crush on, right? Uh, but all was growing great. I was feeling wonderful. And then until inevitably our teacher, Miss Lee, caught the passing of the notes and confiscated it. Uh, rightly so, we got into trouble, but you know what the worst part was? Uh, is that the girl was made aware of it, and uh, it broke into tears, and she was crushed. You know, we experience it from an early age. There's something about being in the club, something about being on the inside that just makes us feel good. It makes us feel important and validated, and it allows us to then pass judgment on other people who are on the outside, doesn't it? Uh, we don't grow out of it. It seems to just continue all our lives. It just takes different forms. Uh, we find our sense of, uh, of importance and belonging to a particular group, and then we use our elevated sense of, of self-worth to judge others as being less important uh, or being of less value th than we are. Uh, maybe it's a book club that you, be you belong to, and you find yourselves looking down on those who are less well-read uh, as you are. Uh, maybe it's at church, God forbid, uh, and you think the way that, that your church worships is the right way, right? Uh, and you kind of look down on people who do it differently. Uh, or maybe you think your church is the largest and you're the best and you just look down at all those, gosh, all those little churches, they aren't doing it right. Uh, you know, we're so much better than them. But it also works the other way around, as Chuck Holliday is always quick to point out to me. Uh, we can do the same thing as a little church looking at big churches and say, you know what? We haven't sold out. Uh, we're the pure. We're, we're the righteous ones. Better to be, better be small. And you know, social media uh, has served as a great platform for bringing this all out in us. We find validation and a sense of self-importance in a group that shares our, uh, our ideology, whether it's political or social or whatever it might be. And then we use that sense of, of validation uh, to uh, an importance uh, of being in the right group to then criticize others. And we justify our judging because, well, of course, we're right and they're wrong. But what all this exposes in us is something that's really much deeper. It really exposes sin in us. Uh, when it comes to sin, uh, there's really two issues. Uh, the first issue is if uh, we don't be believe in it at all. That's a problem. 
Uh, we think that people are just good at heart and, and without maybe societal pressures or, uh, or the way someone was raised that people would be good and would always do good things. And that's a problem because it runs contrary to, to God's word. But I'm going to make a reasonable assumption this morning because looking out there, I know most of you really well and I know that's not the primary issue for us this morning. Most of us believe in sin. Uh, we believe that uh, people are sinful. Uh, most of us fall into a second category, and that is the second issue. Uh, and that is that we have this ab ability to trivialize the sin in our own lives while magnifying the sin in others. We believe in sin, uh, but we don't really think uh, on day-to-day -day level it's really all that bad in our lives or we're really all that bad. I mean, yes, we sin at times, but uh, overall on the scale of things, the good we do outweighs the bad, and so we're pretty good, uh, which then frees us to judge others. It frees us to judge others, others that we feel are worse than we are. And it makes us feel better about ourselves and, again, validates us and gives us some sort of sense of, sense of worth and value. Uh, our predominant problem isn't uh, that we deny the existence of sin in the world or in our lives, but rather that we fail to grasp just how deep sin runs and just how desperate our situation is in relation to God and being right with him. And that, my friends, is what our gospel reading this morning in Mark 9 is dealing with. Our sin is much deeper than we realize, and the consequences of sin leave us in a far more desperate situation than we're willing to admit. Because if we really grasp how deep our sin was and how grave the consequences and the desperate condition of our lives, we would not have time to judge anyone else. But the good news is that when we do come to the understanding of the full depths of our sin and truly the desperate condition that we're all in, then the hope of the gospel, it comes alive in our hearts. It comes alive and it bears fruit. And that's what we really want, don't we? It's what I want. It's what I want for you, even if you don't want it. Uh, I, you know, I want our hearts to come alive with the good news of the gospel and to be transformed I want us to be full of hope and joy and gratitude over what God has done for us, that the thought of judging other people would never even cross our minds. So I want to invite you to, to open up your Bibles, to open up your bulletins, uh, whatever you prefer as we turn to uh, Mark 9, 38 to 50, or at least a portion of it we're going to look at today as we work through this together. You know, for those who weren't with us last night or last week, we've been working through uh, in the lectionary Mark chapter 9. Uh, and last week, the disciples were arguing with themselves over who was the greatest among them. Uh, and Jesus taught them, and if you want to be first, you must be last of all, a servant of all. Uh, but last week, we talked about there's still a catch-22 in that, isn't there? And that is that if our motivation is to be first and trying to be last, then pride is really our motivation in the first place. And our really only hope is in putting our faith and trust in the one who humbled himself for us. Well, that conversation that Jesus began last week with the disciples, it continues today in our reading this morning. Uh, and this is what we're told in verse 38. John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Now, before we get to Jesus' answer uh, to the question, uh, can you see any problems with this right off the bat? Okay, maybe it's obvious. Uh, but I'm going to still spend a little time in it. Uh, someone was casting out demons in Jesus' name, uh, meaning they were seeking Jesus, and his power to cast out the devil and his minions uh, out of this person. Furthermore, the language of John's words here tell us the person was not only doing it in Jesus' name, uh, but that it was working. <laughs> Can you imagine that? It was working. Uh, demons were being cast out. The power of God was at work. But despite being done in Jesus' name and being su successful, the disciples saw it and they tried to stop him. They tried to stop him. And notice the word tried, meaning they weren't successful in their attempts. 
And the rationale and the justification that John gave and the disciples gave was that he wasn't following us. He wasn't following us. Meaning this successful exorcist who was working under the authority of Jesus' name uh, was guilty primarily of not being in the club. That's what he was guilty of. He he was not one of the privileged few uh, that were with Jesus. And the disciples judged him not by the fruit of the deeds uh, or by the name of Jesus that he professed, but rather simply because he was not part of the club. Why did John and the disciples judge this man? Because they judged themselves to be more important and essential and privileged as one of Jesus' chosen few, as one of the apostles. And when we judge other people, we're doing so from the very same position of superiority, from that holier-than-thou attitude type of mentality. Uh, we, think that we're more, we think much more highly of ourselves than we should. And, uh, and we, the truth is, we have much too narrow a view of what the club really is according to the gospel. And we'll get more to that in a minute. And the reason is because we don't really take our own sin seriously enough. Thinking, you know what, we really aren't that bad. Other people are worse than us. Then in verse 39 through 41, Jesus offers the correction. And he highlights, I want to just highlight it by this verse, verse 40. For one who is not against us is for us, he says. Then in verse 42 to 48, Jesus takes them deeper into the reality of sin and the desperate consequences of sin in our lives. And he begins with verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, remember this conversation is happening in the same context of Jesus having brought uh, this child into the midst and using the child as uh, a visual example of what he was teaching to the disciples. And last week we we talked about how Jesus wasn't just talking about children here. You know, we, we tend to think that Jesus brings a nice, innocent, you know, beautiful little child into the midst, into his midst. Uh, And so we're supposed to, if we took that as being the logic, then we'd say, oh, we're only supposed to welcome innocent and beautiful people into our lives. Uh, But there was more to it. Jesus was bringing a child, and having four of them myself, children aren't easy. Uh, Children whine. Children make mistakes. Uh, They're wonderful, but they can be difficult, just like we all are difficult. Jesus Jesus has brought uh, this, uh, this, this, teaching into the same context. If we really take Jesus as what he was saying at this time to about if you cause one of these little ones to sin in that same context, it's absolutely horrifying. Who hasn't been the cause of someone else sinning? You know, maybe you did something to cause someone to get angry and they acted out in anger. Uh, maybe you lied to someone causing them to, to lie or to fall into a lie or to follow you. Or maybe it wasn't what you did or what you said. Maybe it was the other side. Maybe it was what you didn't do or you didn't say that caused someone to fall into sin. You know, if you follow the causation, right, the logic, you, call, you follow the line of every action or inaction uh, we make or every word that we say or we don't say, inevitably down the road, we cause someone to sin. Somewhere down the, road, down the road, it's impossible to ever have possibly avoided it. And Jesus said it would be better for that person to have a giant stone hung around their neck and to be thrown into the sea, meaning it would be better to be drowned to death than to cause someone to sin. This is how serious this sin is. It requires death. It would be better for death than to have caused someone to sin. And then Jesus continues to build on this in verse 43. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled uh, than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. You think Jesus and God take sin lightly? Then you're mistaken. Jesus isn't just using hyperbole here. He really means it. This is serious. Because as Romans tells us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. 
Death isn't just the loss of the breath in our lungs or the brain function in our heads. It's eternal separation from God, which is the unquenchable fire, the suffering of hell. We can't even fathom what a world absent of God looks like. Because God has not removed his presence from this world. That's what hell is, which awaits all those who are guilty of sin. Verse 45 and 46 make the same point again and again. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell. Jesus is using this rhetoric to drive home the seriousness of the problem of sin that we have in our lives, the depths of it and the consequences. But don't think that the eye or the hand or the foot actually is what causes us to sin. We can cut off our hand, we can uh, cut off our, our feet, we can tear out our eyes, but the root cause of sin remains the same. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught about it. Jesus said, you, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. He said, you've heard, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Friends, we can cut off our hands, our feet, gouge out our eyes, uh, and it will not stop the problem of sin in our lives. Because we can be blind, and we can still have lustful thoughts. We can be handless or footless and still be angry with our neighbor Blindness doesn't cure lust. Lameness doesn't cure anger or resentment that we have towards other people. The problem of sin, our problem of sin, it runs far deeper. It's in our very nature. It's in the very core of our being, and it affects everything in our lives. And the consequence of sin is death and hell, eternal separation from God, eternal suffering. It brings Because Jesus tells us in verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The worm, he calls it, the parasite that feeds on our hearts and our souls is the sin within us. Our desire to be the most important, the one in control of our lives all the time and to sit in judgment over everyone around us. You know, uh, we give our dogs and our cats heartworm medicine, don't we? We do it because if we don't, what what do the worms do? They eat, they eat them from the inside, right? They kill them. Undealt with the, the, the parasite of our sinful hearts will kill us. It'll separate us from God, sending us to the eternal fire. So if cutting off our hands or our feet or gouging out our eyes won't save us from our sin, then what's the point? <laughs> what's Jesus getting at here? Why is he telling us all this? Well, here it is. The only way to life with God and his kingdom, it requires a sacrifice to deal with our sin. Someone must die. Someone must be drowned to death. Something must be cut off if we're to have life with God. Something has to be gouged out of us if we're to truly be alive to God and his kingdom In other words, a sacrifice has to be made to kill the parasitic worm that infects our hearts. You know, Samson Parker in 2007 was a a farmer who was working alone in his field in South Carolina when he got his his right arm stuck in the mechanical picker uh, for his farm. The piece of machinery, it trapped his arm, uh, and also the machine caught fire at the same time. Uh, faced with that possibility of just burning to death slowly, uh, trapped by this piece of heavy machinery that was on top of him, he decided to take out his tiny eight centimeter, three inch pocket knife and saw through his arm in order to escape and live. You know, a firefighter named Doug Spinks arrived at the scene to find Parker burned and bleeding profusely. 
uh, and then would, but ended up helping to save his life. Parker later recounted the events of that day as he sat in an interview uh, in front of that same piece of, of machinery that had been his all near death trap, noting he believed it was the fire which kept him from passing out from the shock and pain of sawing his own arm off with a pocket knife. Parker had to cut off his own arm to save his life from the fire. Friends, cutting off our arm won't save us from sin and the fires of hell, but a sacrifice will. Only it has to be a perfect sacrifice, one that is without blemish, one that is perfect, one that's without sin. That's the beauty and the power of the gospel for all of us, that Jesus died for us, that Jesus cut himself off for our salvation 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the apostle Paul wrote, for our sakes, God made Jesus who had no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. God put our sin upon Jesus who, as the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, was cut off from the land of the living. Jesus died the death that we deserve, the death of a sinner. He paid the full penalty and faced the consequence of our sin so that when we put our trusting faith in him and his sacrifice for us, we're forgiven, we're made clean, we're purified, we are born to a new life that is truly alive to God and his kingdom. That's the good news of the gospel. In Christ, by his sacrifice on the cross and resurrection from the dead, we are given the gift of his righteousness by grace through faith. And our righteousness, that being right with God, it's not our own. We didn't do it. There's nothing we can boast of. We have no high horse to sit upon and cast judgments down on other people. And every time we do, what we're really doing is taking credit ourselves and spitting on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. Friends, our problem is far more serious than we realize. And the consequences are far more dire than we're willing to admit. But the good news is that Jesus willingly died in our place. Jesus willingly took that that millstone and threw himself into the water. Jesus cut himself off for us because he loves us. You know, the disciples mistakenly thought that they alone were in the club with Jesus. Their view was far, far too narrow of what the club really was. The club's bigger than they realized. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He came not for those who were well. He came for the sick, those who were desperately ill with a parasite who is eating them from the inside out. And Jesus on the cross counted himself, himself as a member of the sinner's club, even though he was without sin. When we judge others, we're claiming we belong to a club, but we're claiming we belong to a club that is opposed to Jesus. This is why Paul recognized that although he was an apostle of Christ, called by Jesus, He was the greatest of sinners. If you want to be in the right club, then claim the depths of your own sin. Judge yourself rather than other people and turn to Jesus who died in your place, cut himself off for you, and in Jesus alone, find life in God and in his kingdom forever. Amen. Amen.